I will be creating a pumpkin pattern of Sean Connery. I'm going to be using the a newly it's a new program for me. This is called Affinity Designer. It is going to allow me to uh, create patterns more cheaply than I have in the past with the Adobe platform. This is a not a subscription based program, therefore the cost is much more uh, justifiable. And so with that, I want to, let's go ahead and get started. I'm used to creating patterns in Photoshop using the path pen tool to create a vector path uh, and and then I would take that path and import it, well, export it from Photoshop and import it into Illustrator and create the pattern. There's a much cheaper way to do that. Uh, with this program, I don't have to go to the extra steps. I can just draw it in this program. So let's go ahead and open this file, Sean Connery, picture. Now this is a vector-based drawing platform, but it does allow me to open and, and view and look at and even do some simple things to a uh, raster image, which is what we're going to want to do uh, here. In this platform, it has what's called personas. The persona is basically a um, set of settings based on what you're going to be working on or working with. It, it's a, a, a tool set, if you will. Um, when I'm in the designer persona, which is the workhorse, the main place in this program for working, I'm going to see tools related to vector uh, drawing kind of things. If I switch over to a pixel persona, then I'm going to have tools related to dealing with uh, raster based images. Um, in this persona, of course, there's another persona here would be for exporting things, but right now in this program, I'm going to switch over to a pixel persona for a moment. I might could do this even with the other one, but let's look at here. I want to do an adjustment. Um, first of all, I want to duplicate this layer. And in this newly duplicated layer, I think what I want to do is go to an adjustment. Yeah. And posterize this. And we're going to posterize it with uh, white 5 and then accept. I think I'm just going to hit return. When I design patterns, I'm mostly looking at uh, what parts I'm going to keep and what parts I'm going to discard, what parts of this um, face are going to remain black, as in the darkest part of the pumpkin design, uncarved basically, and what parts are going to be white or carved all the way through. So you're going to see in the final pumpkin a um, portions that are that, that are carved all the way through, which are going to show up as the lightest orange. I'm going to call them blacks and whites. Uh, it would be the white of a pattern, and um, others are going to remain dark. So part of the reason for posterizing this is to give me, as I'm designing this, a view of what. Uh, where I'm going to start thinking of laying out the lines, the things that are going to become light, and the things that are going to become dark. So I'm going to create a posterized uh, 
layer of five, a level five. I'm going to come back into the background. I'm going to duplicate this again. And this time, I'm going to hide the first one I did. And in this one, I'm going to create another adjustment, uh, posterize, and leave it at four. This gives me, as I turn this one that's five on and off, see, I can see two different versions of, of posterize that's showing me different places for me to make decisions on what to retain and what to you know what to carve through what to leave and what to what's going to be black and what's going to be white basically um, let me back up all right keep in mind that in a pumpkin design here's for example is a pumpkin design of Van Halen in, in a kind of showing in a pumpkin. You can see in this pattern design that the places that are cut through, which are orange, I'm going to call, when I'm creating the pattern, the, the blacks and the whites. Let me back up here and look at this. See, here's the white of the pattern. It's going to be cut all the way through and the black is going to remain pumpkin. All right. This is a, uh, a simple black and white. Well, that's actually kind of an advanced pattern, but it's, uh, it's simply black and white. We do have patterns that uh, I often create which have a level of color that does not get carved all the way through, which is basically sculpted. That I call grays because in a three color version um, and let me show you an example of that this is Camilla Banis I'm not sure if I'm even pronouncing that right she stars in uh, soap opera at any rate you can see that there is a, a darker orange you've got the light yellow this uh, lighter orange and the dark orange of the pumpkin it's forming a pattern, but these areas do not get carved all the way through. In, in a black and white version of this, it's going to look like this. This just gives me a very higher contrast, clearer picture of, of what this pattern is going to look like. So I, I'm often going to be viewing as I'm creating patterns. Um, I want to turn on the blacks and the whites and the grays so that I can see uh, as I'm creating it how this is uh, going to look. When I, when I do my finished piece. So, um, that's what we're looking at and that's what I'm doing when I posterize. It's giving me an idea what I want to cut through, what I want to keep, what I want to discard, what's going to be black, what's going to be white, and what may be gray. As an inspiration, when I start looking at these, see, my objective as an artist when I'm creating pumpkin patterns would be to make them as simple as possible. I don't always achieve that goal. And part of that's because I would say I'm a lazy designer and it's easier to add some gray level sculpting to the patterns to make it work out than it is to actually take the additional effort that is often required to make a better pattern more simple. <laughs> it, as a pattern creator, um, it's often more work to, there's more talent <laughs> involved in creating a pattern that's easy to carve for people. The role model for this kind of pattern for me would be uh, Zombie Pumpkins, Rick Weistrand, if I'm pronouncing his name right, is uh, he's he does some beautiful work and I'm, I've got tiny little thumbnails because I, I haven't bothered to download the, the full version but if you go to his website you can see 
a lot of examples of simple black and white. I mean, this could even still be considered a more advanced pattern than, especially more advanced than three triangles in a mouth, right? But it's a simpler pattern because it doesn't involve a lot of sculpting. And you're just really going to carve through a lot of these simple things. This is a, a very pixelated image because it's a, a thumbnail from his site. Here's a here's another another one that you see when you look at these. Notice that there's no three tones. It's just straight black and white image. Um, and I, I will look at these just kind of as an idea of what uh, 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 inspiration it might drive me to help in creating my own pattern. Notice that you, you have to have places where the flesh, you can't have what's called floaters sitting out in the middle of space. But sometimes as you're creating a pattern, you've got an eye that, or a, some feature that just ends up kind of floating in space and if I try to connect it in some way it uh, it could influence how that it looks so there's there's kind of a talent a gift if you will to creating um, designs that uh, where you can just do it in two tones and call it and, and actually be recognizable as what that is this connection here, this nose across here helps, but often you need to show the whole the whole nose because the face requires that to be recognizable. Uh, if I'm any if I'm making any sense, it's a difficult thing to describe. Um, I mean, notice how this is connected here with the eyes across here. Sometimes that's real. It's real great when you can do that because then it makes this design. I've got one shape right here that I don't have to connect down through to a nose. But often, many of these patterns, you you do need to connect it through to the nose, the cheeks, and the and this mouth feature. When you get all this stuff connected and going, um, well, I'm just bringing these up to to show that. Uh, You can you can look at this for ideas. If I'm if I'm carving this, if I'm going to create a pattern of uh, Sean Connery here, then I've got to make some decisions about what is going to be straight black and white, and what. In this case, if I connect this all the way down through to here to the cheek. Um, could create a floater here, the eye. In this case, it's not going to because it's going to be connected to the side. But structurally speaking, <laughs> the uh, the eye could, the first thing to when it starts wilting is this eye is going to droop here. And if I'm able to keep it connected here through the nose, then, then this design is going to be a stronger design. It's going to last longer in the pumpkin etc. I mean, it's just some of these things you have to start considering, especially if you've got some feature that just ends up dangling in space, and then you got to sit there and say, well, okay, now how do I start figuring out how to attach that feature to the to something so that it works? That's kind of a laborious explanation about um, the design, but uh, I mean, look at zombie pumpkins. That can give you some inspiration for how to create your designs. Most of this just comes with experience, and I'm speaking uh, from a place of years of experience and just looking at something like this and seeing just what it is I'm going to cut out. Um, so with that as an introduction, uh, I do like to have kind of two different levels of posterization to show up here so that um, it starts giving me ideas on where to place my lines and just start looking at it. Uh, the best thing that I can do is to actually start creating the pattern and then once in a while talk my way through what I'm doing as I do it. Um, another thing I like to do with these layers is let's turn this back on and add a levels to this. 
and um, turn this up to about like 70 or something. It just lightens it because as I work with the pen tool, it's just going to make the path visible as I'm working with it while still being able to see the, these. I'm going to back out of this pixel persona and get into this designer persona. In fact, I think all that I just did could have been done while in this designer persona. I didn't need to go into the pixel persona to do that. <coughs> these options for these layers right there, they're still available right here. So uh, um, I don't need to worry about different set of tools for doing patterns. Um, what I want to grab right now is the pen tool. P is the keyboard uh, shortcut that uh, if you want to become more efficient at using these programs, it's good to become familiar with the, uh, with the keyboard shortcuts. I do want to say that as you're working with uh, with these tools, this this is you're going to need to become familiar with the pen tool to operate in this environment. Um, I'm not going to explain how to use this tool. There's videos and tutorials that will show you the the information you need to know about how to use the pen tool. I'm just going to say that it's, uh, it's a tool that you're going to want to learn how to use if you, if you want to create a real sharp, vector-based, clean uh, pattern. You can go to just start. And notice how I will turn on and off this layer occasionally to see, to get some now, I'm using keyboard shortcuts. This is another thing to understand about um, the Affinity Designer tool. If you hit the space bar, it's going to bring a, a little hand where you can pan. And while I have the space bar down, if I hit the control key, this is going to be different keys if you're on a Mac, but uh, it's going to turn into a magnifier. And now I can zoom in. And if I hit the Alt key, it turns into a negative and I can zoom back out. So uh, learning the key commands to doing this is going to make your life much easier because it's, uh, you don't have to have a whole separate navigator window up to... Uh, to navigate your, your drawing. You can kind of do it on the fly as you're working with the tool. So. Now in this case, I'm going to go ahead and um, try and make this nose one long piece, you'll notice that if I'm following the line that the poster eyes gave me, I would keep making this path all the way around and include the cheek, but I'm going to see what it looks like by just keeping this nose one piece and making the, that its own separate cheek piece. Every um, Every path I'm creating is going to be a closed shape in this program that is defining a shape that's going to be cut out of a pumpkin. Okay, so that's why I'm, I'm saying these all need to be closed shapes. And uh, There, that's a, that's a closed shape. That's 
that shape is going to be cut out of the pumpkin when, when we're done with this. So all I'm looking at here are shapes. Um, take note, the default mode for a, for a pen tool, at least that's what this defaulted to when I opened it up and started drawing, is it's going to draw these shapes that I'm creating with a, uh, an outline. You'll notice that um, the stroke is set currently at point 0.8. Um, and that that's what this line represents is a stroke. I am not concerned with this stroke at this at the, at the moment. Um, in fact, I often like to design, prefer to design with no stroke at all. I'm just trying. To, I'm trying to create um, just these outlines, these shapes. Focus on the shape and not worry about how thick that line is. Uh, I'm, I'm starting to notice as I zoom in here that this 0.8 um, stroke on this is a little bit thicker and uh, more obnoxious than what I would prefer. If I change that to, you know, maybe 0.1, then I'm just going to get a real fine uh, line, right? Um, I don't need any stroke at all. But uh, if I didn't have any stroke going on right now, then these lines would disappear. So here's uh, how this, this program works that differs from what I'm used to having worked in Photoshop is um, it's creating a separate curve every time I place down the pen to draw a new shape. All these, these curves that we see here, if I start turning them off, you'll see that the, the, these things that I've created, right, they disappear. I can't see the, the path. Um, so it helps to have some width set on this so I can see them. The other option is, and I'm actually used to working this way, is to have this set at zero, because I, I, I don't want to stroke it. And then start creating uh, a new path. And in this case, let's look at this particular shape we're trying to draw here of him. Alright, so I finished drawing this shape under his eyes, and you'll notice if I hit the tool to uh, to pan or zoom, that it disappears momentarily while I pan into place, and then I let go of the key keyboard, it, it, it reappears. Um, but now I'm done with that shape, but remember this doesn't have a width on it, it's zero. So I'm still creating a path, it's just that the path isn't going to be visible when I start creating another shape. So if I click and drag over here and start creating this new shape for this highlight on the nose, um, this, this part of the path disappeared, right? It's gone. Um, well, I don't like that because I want to see this as I'm creating it. So if I were creating these paths like I'm used to doing, 
and that is I'm just laying down the path itself. I'm not creating outlines on the path. So I'm, it, this is actually a an exploration of discovery for me and learning new way to do things in this new program. I've been designing patterns for so long the same old way that it's uh, um, was just habit, right? Um, but uh, using a new program is forcing me to rethink things in a different way and say, well, let's see, I could learn how to use this tool in different ways. If I wanted to see these paths without having any width on it as I'm creating them, then the trick I would want to do is to turn this add new curve to selected curves object on and now when I start creating my next shape this one doesn't disappear because it is adding this new curve to this existing one I already did down there right Now these shapes are part of one curve object. If I wanted to join these, then I would simply highlight both of them. That would be control click or shift click to, to select multiple layers. Then I want to come up here and say add. And it will add that together. They're now part of this same path. And if I continue to keep working with this option turned on, all of these are going to be part of this new same path. That's how I'm used to working. Part of my exploration and discovery and learning new things, maybe I might choose to keep these as separate curve paths and objects. Um, with a uh, with a width on my stroke selected, so there's options in how you choose to 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 do things. In, in an important feature on faces is going to be the shape of the eyes and the nose and the mouth. These things are important features. On a mouth that has a beard and a mustache going on, the the beard and the mustache are really going to be mostly dark but the but you're going to have to show hair like features that define that this is a beard while well, at the same time you have to decide, I still have to show the shape of this mouth, right? Um, when you're dealing with facial hair like this, uh, you just have to make some decisions on how do I still show the shape of this mouth feature while at the same time, well, basically I have to do it using hair like feature stuff because without the facial hair I'm just going to outline the shape of the mouth and and there you have it but uh, but now I have to introduce an element of uh, taking some artistic license in places to say well even though it doesn't show exactly I, I still need to depict um, you know how I'm going to show the shape of this mouth. All lips are going to have this this highlight here, and this isn't really a defining characteristic of the mouth. But uh, but where the upper lip and these lower lip areas, this is going to be an area that says this is where Sean Connery's mouth is. You know. One 
thing to be aware of in creating these paths is um, the red indicates that this is where the path um, do I want to say the, the beginning or the end uh, I guess the red spot is the, is the beginning of the path and it ends here but if I want to continue drawing from this spot to close it the shape then this it, it matters <laughs> where the beginning or the end is I can't I can't grab my pen tool and start drawing from this place and continue to work my way over and close it here it's not going to let me do that I can start here from this place and um, I'm just choosing to try and capture the shape of the mouth while at the same time making the edges look a little jagged and hairy because this is actually beard uh, hair that we got going on and that's always uh, well it's you have to watch your pattern kind of capture something hairy like If I want to continue drawing from this point and continue this shape from here instead of starting back over here, then what I need to do is switch it. So I've got to have this, this path object here selected and then switch this changes the beginning so that I can take off from here where I left off because it won't let me on the uh, on the red that would be the beginning of this path and I, I can't start drawing from the beginning I've got to draw from where I left off that's why I need to switch this direction that reverses the curve shape I'm used to doing an alternate click right inside that dot to continue for, because right now that is a smooth curve shape but I want to sharpen that corner point right there I'm used to clicking within the dot and clicking and dragging down to make that a corner point while preserving this curve that used to be here but in this case it's it doesn't allow me to do that so I'm going to undo this and I actually have to click the okay this is called the node there's a name for these things this extension line thing out here <laughs> it has a, a name but if I um, control click to turn this into the pushing alternate and control to select that without to change it into a corner point without affecting the original where it came from you could just sketch this out and run around and adjust these things later if you like to work in a way that you're actually laying out the shape as you go as I've learned to do then uh, then you can manipulate these
uh, now at some point you want to start looking at this and seeing it for how it's actually shaping out in my case um, I have a bit of a trained eye and I can look at this and I can tell uh, yeah this these are going to be white and the rest is going to be black and it's, uh, it's going to look okay um, but even with a trained eye I often actually really do want to see how this is coming along right in, in, in black and white reality um, so to do that in this case um, we want to create a black background so I'm going to grab a rectangle to let's see select off of this I need a rectangle tool because I'm going to just draw a big rectangle a big kind of a square thing behind here right I want to color that thing um, black there it's black now where did it place that box there it is uh, it's placed down here below all the curves right where we want it that's I want it there because I want it behind all these curves but these curves they have outlines but they don't have a fill so this is where now let's turn this rectangle off for a minute we know that we got a black rectangle there right that black rectangle is placed there so that I have a black background to to frame these curves so I can start seeing what it is I'm working with um, I'm going to turn it off for a moment and um, this is how where the way I used to work is coming in handy because all these curves with little fills that's created a whole slew of them they're, they're separate shapes I actually really do want all of these to be one curve shape or all, all on the one as if they've all been added to the same I don't want to say shape what do I want to say I'm going to add them all together okay that's just one it's one curve layer but that curve layer has applied the point eight stroke I don't want a stroke on it okay take turn this to, to zero it has no stroke but I do actually want a fill and I want that fill to be white actually and not black so there now I have a white fill that curve layer which is made up of several shapes is uh, now it's one instead of a scattered whole bunch of other in, in different places um, if I turn on my rectangle now and hit this move tool which the uh, V quick key and I can click outside of something so that nothing is selected but see now I see a I can see this face beginning to emerge and it's actually starting to look fairly okay see now one concern I was having is about making that nose one shape come down here without dragging it over and including this cheek because that's kind of how uh, that's how this posterized thing shows it here right see it shows it without uh, as kind of one shape here well I wanted to close that nose for structural reasons as you're creating as you're carving a pumpkin um, and I want to see how that looks does it look okay yeah I think it's, it's gonna it's looking okay um, in a pumpkin some of these places are going to get pretty tight so you want to thicken the dark places as much as you can for pumpkin patterns but the lips and what I've done here with this cheek it, it started it defines the mouth okay right and you can tell that because I've jagified 
these edges that this is this is very beard like and mustache like up here right so uh, I think it's looking it's looking okay I'm getting ready to continue working in this case I just turn these two things off but when I click my curve I can still see my outline that I'm creating without having the fill turned on right I don't need the fill turned on because I, I don't want to see that fill because I'm still looking at, and, and, and you may choose to work in a completely different way. I'm, I'm demonstrating how it is I create patterns and how, this is how I see things. This is how I work through them. Um, in other words, this is what's working for me. Uh, if it helps you to, uh, to see how I do it, then, then that's great. Uh, see, I want to hit the curve. Since it's the move tool active right now, I don't want this big block. I want my pen tool back there. Now I'm looking at this in a pen state. Now I should be able to just click this on again and see it's all white. I'm just drawing these in white shapes and uh, but because I have it turned off I don't see them filled but I can just turn on the fill for both these items and uh, if I don't want to see all these in dots then I just switch my tool to something else and, and there we go. I can see my pattern and I can kind of start to tell does that look like what I want it to look like? Um, drag this black box up there more um, and it's actually not uh, something about this is not looking as Sean Connery like as I want it to look and it's at this point where I have to start asking artistic questions. What features, what is it about Sean Connery's face that makes him look like Sean Connery? Um, and a lot of this is, uh, is, did I pick a good picture that actually captures his... Um, his likeness. I mean, you know, this is a good Sean Connery look. If you are given a picture from somebody, a friend says, here, turn this into a pattern for me, then sometimes you're just, you got to work with what you were given. If you're 
able to choose the picture, then you can start making decisions like, yeah, that one looks more like him than that one. Anyway, I chose this picture because I thought it really did capture a good likeness of Sean Connery. Obviously, it's because it is a picture of Sean Connery. But, uh, um, so, you know, you kind of turn things off, look at the picture itself. What is it that really highlights that this is him, you know? Uh, that little dark spot. This is a, you know, this is a, a feature we want to keep. Um, have I captured the shape of the nose and the eyes? Uh, see, I have to start looking at this. And uh, um, what am I missing? How come it's... I have too much forehead going on here, right? Is that, that part of it? Uh, maybe. Um, exaggerate some of the expression. So this is some of the stuff I have to start exploring if I decide I don't really like the pattern and, and how much it is or isn't actually really capturing what I'm trying to I'm trying to achieve. So I'm going to start looking at um, changing something about my curves here. In this program, um, well, you can approach. I want to try and capture some of this, these these creases in the forehead. Uh, but now I can do that one or two ways. One, I can I can come in here and start adding nodes, and then turning these into uh, sharp nodes, and then start shaping it to. To, to try and capture some of this line stuff. But in my case, I usually prefer to just nuke this whole section and redraw it um, rather than sit here trying to mess around reshaping nodes. Uh, again, this is going to be one of those preferences of how you choose to, how you like to work. So I'm going to um, delete. Well, let's see. How how's this? I'll delete one of these. And take this. I <laughs> in the Photoshop path, I could delete that line. It would just remove the whole line. In this case, it deletes the node. So I actually have to click a node and tell it to um, break the curve right there. Uh, and that now that curve is broken. And with the curve broken, I can now come back in. Now, this eyebrow is, is, is a feature of, uh, I think that really is, a, is kind of one of these defining, maybe, of, uh, I want to try and capture something about this in the pattern. I think that helps there.
Okay, so I want to do a, do an experiment here. Um, let's let's get back into a, a different tool so everything isn't. Turn these on. Let's look at what I got. I mean, what, what, did that help it? I think it did. Yeah, that 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 helped things a bit. I think it looks a a little bit more like him. Um, I like to um, test, uh, sometimes test different looks, different options. Would it look better this way or that way without losing what I've already did? So. I want to take this curve and duplicate this, all right? Because I've got one that I, I kind of like, but I want to do an experiment, see if uh, if I change something, does it look better having changed it? So let's uh, turn these things off. And s since uh, that one's off, let's hit my pen tool again and work with this one that's still on and turn it off but make sure it's selected so that I know I'm working on a new version of this curve I want to join this face here it means I need to take this curve and break it That way this curve is now broken. Delete those extra nodes there. And then I want to add a node here and break it at that point. Uh, okay, so this is where <laughs> it gets strange because this whole thing is being treated as one curve layer. I want to break it again right here, but it's not giving me that option to break things twice. Ah, now it lets me. All right. Okay. Um, we're going to want to select this particular line shape. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm using the right terminology. We're going to reverse the order because what I want to do is select. <laughs> um, oh good grief. Uh, the red end in the beginning of the other is the, is the way you have to join things. So I'm going to shift click this and close the curve. What does that do? It closed it closed them in a way I don't want it closed. Edit undo this. Um, no, what I wanted to do <laughs> oh, good grief. I'm used to doing the, the Photoshop pathway. Select Um, oh, I turned that into a corner node. I didn't want to do that. Undo. Change curve node. Edit undo. Change curve node. Yeah, I want those both. Uh, select both of these and join. I think that's what I want to do. There we go. Look at that. We joined them. Okay. Um, I want to come here and add to this. 
and close it. Oh, let me just, yeah, we did. There we go. We're closed. Now this is one big shape. So what I wanted to see is how much difference that looks like it makes between the two. Um, zoom out. and uh, select a different tool so we don't so turn my black background right and let's look at option one does that look like does that look good option two turn one off and turn the other one on so by switching back and forth i can say um, how important is that feature that opens up the face right there and in fact I think it helps because if I turn that off um, it, if I turn it back on it looks does it, it I think it helps right so I'm sacrificing some structural integrity right here in the pumpkin if I sacrifice that to get uh, more um, recognition a more recognizable uh, pattern uh, capture the likeness better the pattern is becoming more busy than I prefer but uh, sometimes at this stage I just say you know th 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 this is the point where the lazy in me kind of starts coming out and saying I've been spending too much time on this already and it looks good enough and we'll call it good right I mean I gotta add some neck stuff and a few features down here but that's uh, a point where I could say, you know, I like it. I think it's it's good. So, um, but that's one way you duplicate these curves and you can start testing ones. You know, here's the source object. Do I like it the way it was? And you can compare, right? You can start comparing changes that you make um, as you go along. So that's another uh, trick I use when creating patterns. Uh, what else did I want to say in this particular training video? It is this, that if you don't want to be spending tons of money on a subscription for software, then this Affinity Designer is, is a great tool to replace what I've been doing in Photoshop. However, there is another option that you can use, and it will do all that this does, because I've, I've looked at it, and I didn't do a training video on it specifically, but it's like, okay, um, you're used to driving, uh, you learned how to drive on a Toyota, and now you've been driving for a little bit, and you switch cars, and you hop into a different thing, a Ford or whatever, right? Um, you might have to learn in the new car where the where the windshield wiper button is. The radio is going to be in a different place. The um, defrost is 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 you know, where where do they put that one in this new different car? You're going to learn how to. You're going to have to learn how. Uh, you're not going to have to learn how to drive all over again. You're just going to have to learn the new tool and how it does things, right? So if you open up what's called. Uh, Inkscape, it's a free program, and if you learn to use the vector tool in that one, you can pull in a picture, you can even posterize it, um, you can work with layers, you can do all these things in that program, and voila, you can create uh, beautiful artwork in a free program that didn't cost you anything. This one, at the, at the moment, I think it's... Uh, 
uh, if I remember, I don't know, 60, 80 bucks or something is what, is what this Affinity Designer cost. Um, one time fee, you just buy it there. Now I've, I've got it. I'm not paying a subscription month by one month. So um, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing when you can save money like that. However, you can even do it better with, uh, with the Inkscape. If, if all you're going to do is be creating pumpkin patterns, boy, don't, don't bother spending all the kind of money. You can do pumpkin patterns, and I've done them in GIMP. GIMP has a vector tool, and it's a great free program as well. So there's options out there, and they, uh, they can work well. Anyway, at the moment, uh, I'm going to call this video done because this looks good. I may continue and refine a few things. I'm going to add the neck, and I'm going to turn this into a pattern. But uh, um, at the moment, this, is, uh, this has been a training video on how to use Affinity Designer to create a pumpkin pattern. And uh, I think it's working great for me. Thanks.